Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains and to the Discrete Mathematics course at the University of Cambridge. The videos in this official Discrete Mathematics playlist cover the final five lectures of the Discrete Mathematics course that you have been doing at Cambridge since October. I'm grateful to my much smarter colleague, Professor Andy Pitts, who originally designed this material and produced the slides. There's a rearrangement on the horizon, and this may be the last year that I'm in charge of this part of the course, so these videos will keep my lectures around for posterity. In these lectures, we are going to look at formal languages and related concepts. If you want to know more about regular expressions, finite automata, including deterministic and non-deterministic finite automata, how to generate the automaton that recognizes a particular regular expression, and vice versa, how to tell whether two regular expressions are equivalent, and whether it is possible to construct a regular expression that recognizes whether the brackets in your program are properly balanced, well, hang around. That's the kind of stuff we're going to do. It may sound a little funny to call this mathematics, but this is the kind of mathematics that is most closely related to computer science. At its core, mathematics is about abstraction removing all links with the practical world to leave just a pure core of truth and logic. Beautiful core. You start from some basic principles, draw out all their possible logical consequences, and you build a consistent universe. In computer science, too, we use abstraction. Much of computer science is about manipulating strings of symbols. Formal languages are a powerful tool for describing elaborate sets of strings and the rules that decide whether a string is in the set or not. When normal people speak of a language, they mean something like English or Chinese, which they can use to communicate with other people. The mathematically flavored formal languages we are going to study in this course are much less interesting than that. You can't use them to order food in a restaurant to explain an idea, much less to write a love letter. However, like English and Chinese, they are made of words. And these words are made of characters, which in the case of English would be the 26 letters from A to Z. And that's about as much similarity as there is between our formal languages and the much richer human languages. Our formal languages are simply possibly infinite sets of words, each word made of symbols taken from a finite set. That's it. There's no sentences, nothing clever. Clearly, they are much simpler than human languages, even simpler than computer programming languages. Having said that, you might still use the kind of formal language we still study in this course to define what are the valid terminal symbols in a real programming language. In this first video, I'll introduce you to inductive definitions as a way to define a possibly infinite set of words over a finite alphabet. And I shall also explain how to use this inductive definition to prove that a certain property holds for each of the words in the language, even if there are infinitely many. As ever, if you find this content interesting and useful, please show that you do so by clicking the like button. It's really motivating for me to see that you like what I do, and I'm grateful to those of you who say so. You may also subscribe to the channel, and then you'll be notified whenever I publish new stuff for the benefit of smart computer scientists like you. In this final part of the discrete maths course, uh, we are going to look at things that are the type of maths that uh, computer scientists do as opposed to the uh, maths that mathematicians do. This is what we have uh, on the menu. And this all revolves around the idea of formal languages and ways to reason about formal languages, uh, ways to recognize formal languages with machines called finite automata, properties of formal languages, uh, and so on. So what is a formal language? And why do I have these stupid transitions between slides which I'm trying to get rid of? I don't like pre-made slides like this. Uh, I've inherited this from someone cleverer than me who was giving the course before. I'm a bit stuck with it, uh, but they told me they're going to take this away from me, so I'm not sure I'm going to change this very much. I'm going to use the good slides that I have, even though it's not my 
style of lecturing, really. Um, to explain what a formal language is, we start from the basics. Um, a formal language is basically a set of strings. And we are talking of strings which are sequences of symbols over some kind of set of symbols which we call an alphabet. An alphabet is a finite set sigma whose elements are called symbols. That's all there is to it. The symbols could be anything. So long as the set of symbols is finite, we may call it an alphabet. And here are some examples. The digits from 0 to 9 are a valid set of symbols, therefore a valid alphabet. Uh, the lowercase letters from A to Z are a valid alphabet. Uh, this is the set. You've done the set notation in the rest of discrete maths, haven't you? The set of elements S such that S is included or is a subset of the set that we had earlier of the digits uh, from uh, 0 to 9. So this is one of the 2 to the 10 possible subsets obtaining by taking or not taking every one of these elements. So an element in here could be the set 4, 5, 9. Another one could be the set uh, 0, 9. Uh, and so um, this is the set of all these subsets. And because it's finite, it's valid as an alphabet for us. We could make strings where each element of the string, each character, if you will, of the string, is one of these subsets. That's all fine. What you're not allowed to do is to use, for example, the natural numbers as an alphabet, because this is not a finite uh, set. That's the only restriction we put on. Otherwise, it can be any junk you like, so long as there's only a finite number of symbols in your alphabet. You're then allowed to call it an alphabet. So with that in place, you can make strings over this alphabet uh, just by taking symbols uh, in order. And uh, the, strength, the strings will also be of finite length. And this notation sigma star indicates the set of all strings over the alphabet sigma of any length. This star is a bit overloaded in the context of this uh, course. But it always carries, it almost always carries some kind of meaning of repeat zero or more times. So if you repeat zero or more times an element of sigma, then you get yourself a string. Zero is a valid number of times to repeat it in the sense that if you have a string with zero elements, it's a valid string as well. It's called the empty string, this one over here. So if A, B, C are the characters in your alphabet sigma, then any sequence of A's, B's, and C's, including the empty sequence, is a valid string uh, over this alphabet. So it's, it's a valid member of sigma star. If your alphabet only contains one symbol, in this case A, then um, the strings you can do over sigma are the empty string, or A, or AA, or AAA. And you just string together A's, and that's all you can do with that. But you still have an infinite number of them, even if your alphabet only contains one symbol. If your alphabet is the empty set, which strings can you make over the empty set? This used to be a mini question to see if you're still awake. Well, you can make uh, at least one string, which is the empty string. The empty string uh, will be a word in any formal language, whatever the alphabet. Uh, and in this case, it contains nothing else because there are no characters that you can, no other characters you can put in the string. Uh, this epsilon is, of course, not a character of the alphabet. It's a meta character to describe the empty string. So these notes are alternating big writing, which is the thing that I'm supposed to project on screen and talk about, and the small writing, which is the things that I'm supposed to explain or say uh, in a lower voice. So most of the things that are on this slide are things that I believe I've already said. Um, that we make no notational distinction between a symbol A in the alphabet 
and the strength of length one containing A. So we write them the same way, and we don't bother with putting quotes around stuff and so on. Um, and so sigma is, in fact, besides being a set of, of characters or elements, uh, is also a set of strings of length, length one, and as such is a subset of sigma star, which contains also the ones of length zero, or length two, or length three, or length, of length any length. These are three symbols for stuff that's basically uh, null, empty void. Um, this is the symbol for the empty set. This is the symbol for the empty string. And this is the notation for a set containing one element, and that element is the empty string. And these three things are of different types, and they mean different things. And I'm sure that if you are, um, if you are in this lecture, then you're also doing paper two, then you're uh, at least a 50 percenter, if not a 75 percenter. So you're a computer scientist, so you have no uh, excuse for mixing these things up. This should be basically in your DNA to make this kind of pedantic distinctions. The length of a string is denoted by putting uh, vertical bars around it. Uh, and we are not concerned here with data structures and algorithms. That was two hours ago. And, um, and I've said stuff about the star. It's more <coughs> trivial stuff. Concatenation of the strings is obtained by putting the two strings next to each other. Um, and there's, there's nothing much to say about um, If you concatenate things with the empty string, then you can put the empty string on either side, and it makes no difference. It's like the neutral element for concatenation. Concatenation is associative. You can concatenate on this side first or on that side first, but it is not commutative. So if you take the, your uh, set of strings, sigma star, and your concatenation operator, which is denoted by nothing, I mean, there's no symbol that we use. We just, just suppose the strings. Then this forms a group, but not a commutative group. The length of two concatenated strings is equal to the sum of the lengths of the strings you were concatenating. And notationally, if you pretend you're raising a string to a power, then uh, what you do is you juxtapose n copies of the string. And to extend this notation, if the power you raise it to is 0, then you're juxtaposing 0 copies, which gives you the empty string. That's all, as you would expect and uh, as any reasonable computer science would uh, invent by themselves if they were asked to do so. So a formal language is not the kind of language that regular human beings use. Uh, we say formal to say how um, abstract a view this is. And uh, a formal language is basically a collection of strings. Any collection of strings. <laughs> Uh, over a given alphabet is a formal language over that alphabet. Any set of strings. They don't have to have a special property. Any set of strings. It can be a finite set of strings. It can be an infinite set of strings. Uh, all of them are valid formal languages. Of course, we will mostly be concerned with languages where the strings in the language have some property, but it is not a necessity. And when we, when we talk of grammatical rules and rules for generating the strings in the language. We are not talking of grammar like verb, subject, and complement of things that relate different words. The grammar we are talking about is simply grammar for generating individual words in the language, not for connecting words together. Unlike in uh, human uh, languages. So um, inductive definitions are a powerful way of describing languages. So you will note that there's lots of white space in here, because again, I have printed uh, these slides in a way uh, that would leave you plenty of margin to write your own things and do little exercises and stuff. Uh, when there is a derivation, well, the stuff so far is trivial, so you don't have to do very much. When there's something that is a bit more complicated, you could write your own things in here and see if you can work things out for yourself, and they still make sense. So these inductive rules are 
uh, a powerful expressive instrument for defining formal languages. What you do is you have rules which have a, a line that looks like a fraction. It's not a fraction. It's something where you have things on top which are your input and things at the bottom which are your output. So the things at the top are called the hypotheses of the rule and you, you can have in this case n or in this case zero. You can have any natural number of hypotheses including zero and you have one item at the bottom which is the conclusion of the rule and the way that the rule works is that you say if the stuff that's at the top if every one of the items at the top every one of the hypotheses is in the language then the thing at the bottom is in the language and so the things where there are zero things on top means well whatever whatever happens the things at the bottom is in the language that's why we call it an action and the things uh, which have things on top then you have to first check if every one of these is in the language then if if it is then the thing at the bottom is in the language and um, if these things here are strings then you'd be excused for saying what's the point of asking whether they are in the language. You say, well, if um, we had a language of um, strings over the set A, B, C, and you can say, well, if A, B is in the language, and if B, B, B is in the language, and if A, C is in the language, then B, B, C is in the language. So wh what's the connection between those things? Why did you tell me this thing? Why didn't you just give me an axiom that said B, B, C is in the language? That would have made more sense. So this actually doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the only reason for saying that is because it starts to make sense when the hypothesis and the conclusion are not strings, but templates for strings, things with a variable inside. If there is something that starts this way and finishes and continues this way, then you're making a general rule. So the rule is a rule because it applies to several strings. Uh, and so this is why it will contain not just uh, symbols from your language, but meta symbols which represent variables for strings that could be in your language. I must always remember that I should shrink each of these slides because they still haven't returned the uh, fantastic remote control. So uh, a derivation is something that you exhibit to uh, prove that a string is in the language by basically following all the rules that you could apply to uh, demonstrate that it is. And if we look at an example, then this will be obvious. This um, this language is over the alphabet A and B. So um, our um, set of possible symbols is just A and B. And the axiom is that the empty string is in the language. The rules are U, obviously, is not either A or B. So U is a, is a meta symbol, is a syntactic variable that says any string in the language. If any. If a string called u is in the language, then the string obtained by putting an a in front and a b at the end, this string is going to also be in the language. If you have any string in the language and you put a b in front and an a at the end, that's also in the language. And if you have any two strings in the language, their concatenation is also in the language. That's an inductive definition of a language which contains infinite strings. I've only enumerated one particular string, and all the others can be obtained by repeatedly applying uh, the rules in any allowed combination. And this string A, B, A, A, B, B is in the language, and I can prove that by exhibiting this derivation. Say, well, I can produce the string by taking the axiom epsilon, uh, empty string is in the language, and if I put an A and a B on either side of the empty string, I get A, B, uh, and I redo this over here, and if I put, again, uh, an A and B on either side, I get A, A, B, B. And if I use this other rule, then I concatenate these two existing strings in the language and I obtain this. 
And the same for this other one. Uh, this other one actually gives me the same string, but through a different derivation. It's OK to arrive at one string in different ways. There's nothing that requires uniqueness of the derivation. So inductively defined subsets. If I give a set of axiom and rules over a set of symbols u, then this axioms, set of axiom, axioms and rules clearly defines a language, a subset of u. Uh, and this language is the language of all the strings that can be obtained by applying the axioms and the rules. So this string we saw uh, is in the set, as we've seen two derivations have proved that it is. And this other string, a, b, a, a, b, we claim is not in the subset. There is no derivation on the previous slide that finishes with a, b, a, a, b, but we are saying there is no derivation whatsoever. Even if you spent uh, the rest of the afternoon in here trying to produce derivations, you would never get at this string. Uh, can you figure out why? Uh, and there's a, a hint down here uh, that u is uh, going to be in our subset if and only if it contains the same number of a and b symbols. This if and only if is a bidirectional implication, and one of these two directions is much easier than the other. Uh, keep thinking about that. So uh, we are generally interested in inductive definitions of subsets that are infinite. An inductive definition with only finitely many axioms and rules defines a finite subset. That's the thing I said earlier about having the uh, syntactic variables in there. Otherwise, uh, the thing makes little, uh, little sense. OK. Uh, this last point. In general, there is no surefire algorithmic method for showing that an element is not in a particularly inductively defined subset. So in the if and only if that we had on the previous slide, uh, 15, um, a string is in the subset if and only if it contains the same number of A and B symbols. It's very easy to say that if a string um, It's very easy to prove that all the strings in, in the subset have the same number of A's and B's, uh, but it is not so easy to prove the reverse. Uh, this says, well, there's, there's no method that works all the time to prove the reverse. Now, um, this is an easy example. If you have a binary relation on a set that is the Cartesian product of x and itself. If x, if x is a, b, c, then the Cartesian product of x is the set of pairs a, 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 b, a, c, and so on and so on. Uh, and is basically a, b, c, is the set of all the possible arrows that go from one of these to another one. And any, any set of arrows between these three points, A, B, and C, is a relation on, uh, on this um, set X. And so a relation is a subset of the, still on screen, right? is a subset of the set of pairs over x. And the transitive closure of the relation is what you obtain by saying, if I can go from element s to element t and from element t to element u, then I must also be able to go from s to u. So if I can go from a to a and from a to b, then I must also be able to go from a to b. And it is true, so it, that's fine. If I can go from A to B and from B to C, then I must also be able to go from A to C. So transitive closure, in this case, means, among other things, adding an arrow here 
because this arrow was in here and this arrow was in here. So this means this arrow must be in here. And if I want to write this out using my um, inductive definitions, then what I do is uh, I write an axiom that every, every arrow that was already in R is in the transitive closure, and that if I have an arrow from x to y and an arrow from y to z, then the arrow from x to z must also be in the transitive closure. So, well, that's just a comment on the previous slide, some kind of poor man's animation that uh, this equal thing is something we can prove uh, with the stuff we do in the next slide. And the stuff we do in the next slide uh, is a theorem that says the subset I in U, inductively defined by a collection of axioms and rules, is closed under the axioms and rules. And I haven't defined closed, so maybe I should define closed first. So let's first look at what does it mean to be closed. Closed, very easily, means that if you keep applying the rules, then you're still in the set. It never happens that you apply the rules and you end up outside the set. If by keeping applying the rules you remain in the set, we call the, uh, the set closed. And so it says the subset inductively defined by a collection of axiom and rules is closed under them. That's kind of almost tautological because that's the definition of applying the rules. And it's the least sub subset. That is not quite a tautological. That is something that uh, requires uh, a little bit of thought. It means there is no um, smaller set that uh, is also closed. Uh, and this is the thing after the column restates the same thing. If another set S is also closed under the axioms and rules, then I must be a subset of that. It could be the same, but uh, it must be included in S. So, um, what about this theorem? In here, we are making use of this theorem by um, applying it to a property P of U. So the property P of U could be um, the property that we were talking about earlier when we said uh, has the same number of A's and B's. So there's going to be a set, which is the set of strings with the same number of A's and B's. And there's going to be a set, which is the set of strings defined by my inductive definitions that I produced earlier. Uh, so I, I produced those rules earlier. And these rules define a set, um, which in this case would be called, with the notation of this slide, would be called I. So these things define the set I, set of strings. There's another set defined by the property having the same number of A's and B's. So the set of all the strings that enjoy this property. That's this set S. Uh, the set of strings U in uh, U A B star that enjoy property uh, having the same number of A's and B's. And so this theorem tells us if this set S is closed, uh, then uh, this set over here of the ones that are obtained uh, inductively by applying these rules then is included in it. So uh, every string generated by this has the same number of A's and B's. But because we just show the implication in this way and we haven't shown it in the opposite way, we are not yet sure uh, on whether there are strings with the same number of A's and B's that could not be generated by this. Now, we've been given a hint that it was if and only if, so it, I, we believe it must be true, but we haven't proved this in any way uh, as yet. OK. So this one is a proof of the uh, previous theorem. So. 
the see here I might have it here again Okay, the part that uh, the subset is closed is uh, nothing serious. Uh, it, it follows immediately from the definition, but the part that is the least sub subset is what we want to concentrate on. So uh, we start by saying every possible derivation according to the rules uh, for any subset S that is closed under the rules, then every possible derivation must be included in it. That's, uh, again, pretty obvious, but what you do is you start from the axioms, and uh, the axioms, uh, well, in, f in fact, here it doesn't even start from the axiom. It starts the induction uh, with an even more degenerate case of uh, derivations of height zero, which is the axiom would be height one, uh, and uh, that's trivially verified that uh, the derivations have their conclusion in S because there aren't any. And by induction, you say, well, if I go for the next, uh, the next length uh, from the one that I've done previously, then um, if there is a, a derivation, this is not a rule, so notation may be confusing here, but we are not looking at a rule. We are looking at a derivation where, with things filled in with actual strings, and these things here may be towers of further derivation. This is what this looks like, although you may be excused for thinking that it looks like a rule. So if you, if you have a derivation like this, it will finish with the conclusion C. If the height of the derivation is just one more from the height of the derivations I proved were already in S, then all of these things finish with strings that are in S. And so this thing, I can apply the rule that uh, that's appropriate for this with this conclusion. Uh, and then uh, I have added C also uh, is in S, so I've added one to my height. And so any derivation of finite height will be in S. And therefore, since all the things that I can, um, all the strings in the inductively defined of subset are defined by derivations of finite length, they will also be all included in S. Uh, this is another example which doesn't really add any more understanding to what we've done before. Instead of doing just a transitive closure, we do the reflexive transitive closure, uh, which is uh, every arrow in my relation is in the reflexive transitive closure. Um, for every element, the loop onto itself is also part of a reflexive transitive closure. That's a reflexive part, and that the transitive part is the same as before. If I have x, y, and yz in the relation, then xz has to be in the reflexive transitive closure of the relation. And this is what you do, the way that you apply your um, theorem to uh, proving that all the elements in an inductively defi defined set enjoy a property is simply to apply the property to the axiom and the rules, and if he verifies it for that, then he verifies it for every, um, for every member of the set, for every uh, word in the language. So if uh, the property, once again, is uh, U contains the same number of A and B symbols, then in the case of the empty string, it is true because it contains zero A's and zero B's, in the case uh, of the rules, uh, then the rules were, if U is in the language, then you can add an A in front and a B at the back. Uh, in this case, uh, whatever number of A's and B's U contained, after this treatment, it contains one more of each, and so it still contains the same number. And the same if I add them in the other order, and the same if I concatenate two strings, each of which has the same number of A's and B's. The, their concatenation we also have the same number of A's and B's, although not the same number as the original strings. Now, if you're not going to immediately watch the next video in this series, 
Please attempt question 5 from paper 2 from the Cambridge Computer Science Tripos examination of the year 2009. It will cheer you up to see that what I explained in this video is already all that was needed to answer that question perfectly.